Defeating Darwinism by Changing Mind Chapter 7 Modernism, the Established Religion of the West Three significant events in recent American history mark the culmination of a fundamental change that occurred gradually in U.S. society and is evident in other Western societies as well over the course of the 20th century. The Darwin Centennial Celebration The first of these events was the great Darwin Centennial Celebration of 1959, commemorating the publication of The Origin of Species 100 years earlier. The celebration was held at the University of Chicago, which had been the site of two other scientific milestones of the mid-20th century. One of these was the first self-sustaining atomic chain reaction at a primitive reactor underneath the university's abandoned football stadium in 1942. The second was a famous experiment by chemist Stanley Miller in 1953, which had produced amino acids by sending electrical current through a mixture of gases. Although the Miller experiment proved to lead only to a dead end, at the time it gave scientists confidence that they would soon discover how life evolved on the early Earth from non-living chemicals. The participants in the Darwin Centennial were understandably in a triumphal mood. The prestige of science was never higher. Polio had been conquered by a vaccine. Atomic power seemed to promise abundant, cheap energy. Space travel loomed in the near future. Besides these technological achievements, science had seemingly established that a purposeless process of evolution was our true creator, and hence, had dethroned the God of the Bible. The religious implications of this intellectual revolution were frankly emphasized by the most prominent speaker at the centennial, the British biologist, philosopher, and world statesman, Sir Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley was the grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, who was known as Darwin's bulldog, because he was the most important early champion of Darwin's theory. T.H. Huxley had also invented the word agnostic to describe his own religious views. Julian Huxley, a zoologist, was one of the scientific founders of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, the modern version of Darwin's theory. He was also the promoter of a naturalist religion called evolutionary humanism and the founding secretary general of UNESCO the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. In short, Julian Huxley was one of the most influential intellectuals of the mid-20th century, and 1959 was the high watermark of his influence. Here are some excerpts from Huxley's remarks at the centennial. Future historians will perhaps take this centennial week as epitomizing an important critical period in the history of this earth of ours. The period when the process of evolution in the person of inquiring man began to be truly conscious of itself. This is one of the first public occasions on which it has been frankly faced that all aspects of reality are subject to evolution. From atoms and stars to fish and flowers. From fish and flowers to human societies and values. Indeed, that all reality is a single process of evolution. In 1959, Darwin opened the passage leading to a new psychosocial level with a new pattern of ideological organization, an evolution-centered organization of thought and belief. In the evolutionary pattern of thought, there is no longer either need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So did all the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human selves, mind and soul, as well as brain and body. So did religion. Evolutionary man can no longer take refuge from his loneliness in the arms of a divinized father figure whom he himself created, nor escape from the responsibility of making decisions by sheltering under the umbrella of divine authority, nor absolve himself from the hard tasks of meeting his present problems 
and planning his future by relying on the will of an omniscient but unfortunately inscrutable providence. Finally, the evolutionary vision is enabling us to discern, however incompletely, the lineaments of the new religion that we can be sure will arise to serve the needs of the coming era. In short, the triumph of Darwinism implied the death of God and set the stage for replacing biblical religion with a new faith based on evolutionary naturalism. The new faith would become the basis not just of science, but also of government, law, and morality. It would be the established religious philosophy of modernity. Inherit the Wind The 1960 film version of Inherit the Wind was essentially the artistic equivalent to the 1959 Darwin Centennial. It portrayed the triumph of Darwinism as a Hollywood-style political liberal of the period would have seen it. The forces of freedom and enlightenment defeated the forces of ignorance represented by Christian fundamentalism and thus allowed the young lovers to escape to a better world. Because I have already devoted a chapter to the play and film, I will say a little more about it here except to remind you of the importance of the final scene. At the very end of the film, the wise defense lawyer, played by Spencer Tracy, weighs the Bible and on the origin of species in his hands, shrugs, and then puts the two books together in his briefcase. The implied message is that the two are equivalent and compatible. The book of nature and the word of God are in agreement, provided the latter is interpreted in the light provided by the former. The closing gesture assures the audience that Darwinian naturalism does not aim to abolish Christianity, but to liberalize it so that it is compatible with a properly scientific understanding of our origins. Fundamentalist resistance to evolution is thus shown to be not only unintelligent and futile, but also unnecessary. The liberalized Christianity implied by this final scene in Inherit the Wind has been far more effective in legitimizing evolutionary naturalism than the explicit atheism of Richard Dawkins or Julian Huxley's proposed new religion of evolutionary humanism. Why repudiate Christianity explicitly when its rituals and language can be taken over and given a naturalistic meaning? The death of God does not require the end of religion or even the end of the traditional Christian denominations. On the contrary, the new religion Huxley foresaw was already securely established within the mainline Christian denominations. Liberal ministers and theologians try to save Christianity by demythologizing it, removing or downplaying those supernatural elements that are so embarrassing to modernists. It's fairly easy to do this without openly denying key doctrines like the resurrection, because modernists tend to interpret religious statements as something like poetry. When a poet writes about miracles, scientific naturalists will take no offense, because they know that poetry is meant to convey the feeling of the poet rather than the facts of nature. Likewise, it is possible for a minister or seminary professor to speak with great feeling about the resurrection while signaling to the philosophically sophisticated that the event occurred only in the minds of the disciples. Politically astute scientific naturalists feel no hostility toward those religious leaders who implicitly accept the key naturalistic doctrine that supernatural powers do not actually affect the course of nature. In fact, many scientific leaders disapprove of aggressive atheists like Richard Dawkins who seem to be asking for trouble by picking fights with religious people who want only to surrender with dignity. Besides, debating the truth or falsity of religious claims takes those claims more seriously than they deserve. To say that a statement is false is to concede that it could conceivably be true. This can be dangerous. Focusing the mind of an unbeliever on the question whether Christ's claims are true has often had unanticipated consequences. The most sophisticated naturalists realize that it is better just to say that statements about God are religious, and hence, incapable of being more than expressions of subjective feelings. It would be pretty ridiculous, after all, to make a big deal out of proving that Zeus and Apollo do not really exist. 
the school prayer decision. The third defining event of the mid 20th century was the Supreme Court's 1962 decision in Engel versus Vital, which banned officially the prescribed prayers from the public schools as an establishment of religion. I'm not concerned here with whether officially promulgated school prayers are a good thing, but with what the context of the decision tells us about changing attitudes toward God. The prayer in question came not from the Bible Belt, but from New York, a state with a large and influential Jewish population and a liberal tradition. Far from being oppressive in purpose, it represented a well-intentioned effort by public school officials to bring Jews and Christians together on the basis of the theism that was thought to unite them. The approved prayer read simply, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessing upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. The Pledge of Allegiance had just recently been amended to affirm that Americans are one nation under God, and so educators had good reason to think that a simple affirmation of our dependence on a common creator would be uncontroversial. They were mistaken. By 1962, God in intellectual circles was a discredited concept associated not with education and social unity, but sectarian conflict and superstition. Although America had been remarkably free of religious strife and had welcomed millions of Catholic and Jewish immigrants to what had once been an overwhelmingly Protestant country, the centuries of religious wars and persecutions in Europe had given religion a bad name among intellectuals. Bad historical memories were reinforced by modernist philosophy, according to which God is the subjective creation of human culture. This implies that religion or cultural groups effectively worships a different deity of its own creation. A God who is not the same for everyone cannot unite diverse peoples. Unity must be achieved through a common way of thinking based on scientific reasoning, which is the same for everyone. For American public schools, such a common rationalism was already available, having been prescribed by the immensely influential agnostic philosopher John Dewey. Like Julian Huxley, Dewey consciously saw himself as promulgating a new religion, one that would be established as the basis of government and public education. Whether students recited a prayer or not, public education aimed to teach them to rely on human intelligence and scientific methodology rather than take refuge in the arms of a divinized father figure who exists only in the human imagination. The Supreme Court's school prayer decision thus merely ratified a transformation that had already occurred in the minds of the most influential educators. I am not inclined to protest the decision itself because the prayer could have been a meaningless ritual even if the Supreme Court had approved it. It would have been something like the unenthusiastic required weekly singing of God Save the Queen I witnessed when teaching at an East African school shortly before the end of the British colonial rule. Just as the African students made it painfully evident that they didn't care whether God saved the queen or not, many New York students would have found a way to express their disdain for a religious ritual that the school system itself did not take seriously. If the educators really believed that we are dependent upon God, they would spend time on the subject in the classroom instead of regulating it to a perfunctory ritual. Modernist educators agree with religious people that it is important for students to know who or what created them. That is why they insist on the teaching of evolution as fact. A New Declaration of Independence It would be roughly accurate to say that the 1960s marked the Second American Declaration of Independence, our Declaration of Independence from God. One might expect far-reaching moral and legal consequences to follow from such a declaration, and so they did. Before the mid-20th century, most Americans assumed that the law was based on a set of underlying moral principles that came ultimately from the Bible. Protestants, Catholics, and Jews differed on theological points, but on moral questions, they were in broad agreement. 
For example, concepts about the sanctity of marriage, which today are very much in doubt, were taken for granted. Divorce was discouraged both by law and by social pressure, and educators up to and through the university level did what they could to prevent premarital sex. The underlying moral code rarely had to be defended because it was rarely challenged. There was plenty of hypocrisy, of course, and some elites, like movie stars, lived by different standards. But the rules were as much as they had been a century earlier. The change took hold in the late 1960s as the new religious assumptions that had been gradually gaining ground began to have practical effects. When God's existence is no longer a fact but a subjective belief, and a highly controversial belief at that, God's moral authority disappears. It is no coincidence, therefore, that a drastic change in the nature of marriage immediately followed the change in the ruling philosophy. Both the legal restrictions on divorce and the social stigma evaporated practically overnight. Marriage ceased being a sacred covenant involving God and the community as well as husband and wife. It became an ordinary contract that could be ended by either party practically at will. What used to be called legitimacy became respectable as single parenting and the traditional two-parent household even began to seem ridiculous, a pathetic attempt to emulate an Ozzy and Harriet dream family that never existed in reality. With the divorce revolution came the sexual revolution as the death of God and the availability of contraceptives seemed to make chastity obsolete. Hard on the heels of the sexual revolution came the feminist revolution with a radical wing that explicitly rejected the traditional family model that had previously been regarded as the backbone of society. Feminism demanded an unrestricted right to abortion, which the Supreme Court duly read into the Constitution and imposed on a reluctant nation. Homosexual liberation came next, and homosexual activists quickly gained victim status and consequent support for their cause from the media. The Supreme Court again fell compliantly in line with the cultural trend, managing to find in the Constitution a principle that laws based on animosity toward homosexuality are unconstitutional. The moral and legal reversal was unstoppable once the crucial change in the established religious philosophy had been made. The point is not that people are less moral today than they were previously, but that their morality took a different direction when its foundation shifted. Modernists can be as firm in their moral conviction and as legalistic in enforcing them as were the fundamentalists who ruled the fictional town of Hillsborough in Inherit the Wind. For those who are on the receiving end of it, political correctness is just as coercive as traditional religion and just as capable of stifling free thinking. At Harvard, as at Hillsborough, there are truths that only a very courageous teacher would dare say in a classroom. Modernists have also proved themselves willing to erect legal barriers to ensure that only the established view of religion is taught in the public schools. If at one time it was illegal in a few states to teach evolution, now it is considered unconstitutional in all states to teach or advocate creation as an alternative to evolution. As we have seen, in 1987, a majority of the Supreme Court held that it is unconstitutional for a state to provide for the presentation of a creationist alternative to evolution in the schools, because to do so would advance the religious viewpoint that a supernatural being created humankind. The question whether that viewpoint might be true did not arise, because the majority assumed the modernist position that religious beliefs are about feelings, not facts. Justice Scalia argued in dissent, that the people are entitled to have whatever evidence there may be against evolution presented in their schools. His position baffled the modernists who dominate the legal culture. What evidence could there conceivably be against a scientific fact? Politics is not the answer. People who are dissatisfied with these developments frequently try to reverse them by becoming involved in partisan politics 
or issuing quixotic demands for the impeachment of Supreme Court justices. That kind of political activity has been spectacularly unsuccessful. Indeed, many of the path-breaking judicial opinions that social conservatives complain about were authored by justices appointed by such conservative presidents as Eisenhower, Nixon, Reagan, and Bush. Political action may slow down the rate of change, but eventually, the logic of the ruling philosophy will prevail. At the moment, for example, a majority of Americans assume that marriage is by nature a heterosexual relationship and that a marriage of two men or two women is a contradiction in terms. That is why President Clinton reluctantly signed the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act, defining marriage for purposes of federal law as a union of a man and a woman. Opinion leaders in the intellectual world, however, probably including President Clinton himself, view this act as an exercise in bigotry, much like the laws that once prohibited interracial marriage. Exactly what gives a majority the right to enforce a particular religious viewpoint about marriage when that viewpoint is constantly being called into question not only in secular institutions, but even in mainstream churches? That's a tough question to answer, especially if you have to stick to modernist criteria. The real question is whether the modernist criteria are right or whether we are in the grip of a misguided intellectual fashion that is leading us straight into unreality. Addressing that question is the job not of a mass political party, but of an intellectual and spiritual movement. I regard the idea of a Christian political party with a combination of horror and amusement, because Christian denominations are themselves so confused and internally divided. Naturalist thinking is nearly as prevalent in the religious world as the secular culture. I belong to the mainline Presbyterian denomination myself, and we are having quite enough trouble trying to get our own denomination back on the right road without trying to govern the world in general. Politics is not the answer, but that isn't a counsel of despair. On the contrary, this should be a time of excitement because it is a time of great opportunity. Christianity has always thrived on adversity. What it can't stand is worldly success and social respectability. The Christian philosophy that was overthrown in the 1960s was an easy target because it had become identified with American culture and with worldly ideas like human perfectibility and the inevitability of progress, which are actually profoundly unchristian. The agnostics are not to be blamed for moving into the resulting vacuum. On the contrary, I credit them with helping to clear out some of the rot that has invested the timbers of the house of God. In an age in which people have learned to be distrustful of established institutions of all kinds, being kicked out of the establishment has its advantages. Just about everywhere in the Christian world today, there is a combination of decay at the top and vitality at the bottom. Thank God it isn't the reverse. Denominational bureaucracies and seminaries are desperately in need of thoroughgoing renewal while the pews and parachurch organizations are filling up with dedicated and talented people. The dedicated people have a chance to speak to a secular society that isn't as confident as it was in 1960 and to an intellectual community that is itself confused and divided over the unanticipated consequences of modernism. That's just the sort of challenge and opportunity they ought to welcome. Despite decades of propaganda in the media and indoctrination in the schools, most Americans are skeptical of the philosophy of evolutionary naturalism and materialism. They are also well aware that this philosophy has not led to an era of rationality and social progress that was predicted. Even in the universities where there is a separate culture war raging between scientific rationalists and postmodernists, there is a growing awareness that the ideas of 1960 are ripe for reconsideration. Western society will soon be ready to listen to a better idea. The question is whether we will have one to offer. And we'll continue with chapter eight in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.
Love you guys. And as Tigger says, ta-ta for now.